Um, good evening, my name is Tim Metcalf, um, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Turn Capital Markets Day presentations this evening, following the AGM earlier today. Um, with me today, I've got uh, Al Sisto, the CEO of Turn, Alistair Williamson, the CEO of Wild Networks, and Barry Downs from Shore Valley Ventures. Um, Darren Antill from Device Authority um, apologises, he's currently uh, travelling in, in the US, but Darren has prepared a presentation which has been recorded um, and that will be part of the proceedings this evening. Um, we've also got Sarah Payne with us, but she's uh, sharing the computer with, with Al. Um, I can assure you that is still Al and not Sarah as it says on, on the screen, but Sarah will be coming in later for the Q&A session. Given the number of people that we've got with us this evening, unfortunately, it's not possible to go to you individually, ask you to unmute and, and put your questions to the team. But we do really encourage questions. So if you've got anything you'd like answered, please do use the, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type in your question, and I'll do my level best at the end of the presentations to, uh, to put those questions to, uh, to the most appropriate people. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Al just for a few introductory remarks, and then we'll move on to the presentations. Al. Thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you everyone for attending and signing up for our first Capital Markets Day here in uh, 2022. We're excited to have you here, and uh, really think we've prepared a, an agenda that, uh, that you'll find satisfying uh, and, uh, and exciting uh, with regard to the information being delivered. As Ian Ritchie discussed at our annual general, general meeting this morning, the last two years have been really pivotal for all of us and at TURN and at TURN's companies. Uh, if there's a silver lining from COVID, uh, it, it is one that is all about the acceleration of digital transition if, of IoT devices and, and of the software and, and the use cases for creating a contactless environment that uh, that our companies have been able to leverage and create growth vectors for for now and, and, and for the foreseeable futures. These these contactless environments are and the lack of human resources uh, have really become the key market drivers for our, our company's growth and, and uh, current success in the businesses that they're addressing. Our, our companies, you know, from from the, the, the get go have 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 been been, been fortunate. And, and as part of that fortunate outcomes, uh, last year we were able to launch Wild uh, Networks, uh, Alistair's company, who you'll hear from, uh, on, on a, in an IPO on NASDAQ First North. Uh, this, uh, this was in, an incredible opportunity that we, we took advantage of uh, because of the success of, of Wild and, 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 the, and the team and the business model that Alistair's put together. And, and it's creating new value and unlocking value for us uh, through the, the public participation and our largest shareholder position within Wild. You'll also today be hearing uh, from, from the other companies who also have stepped up and have, have had stepped up in values to, uh, the, the, today uh, in this year uh, from Device Authority and, and Alistair's company. Uh, but but it's, it's also important to know that at Kinetico and in Talking Medicines, uh, we were able to, again, this in, in the year 2021, create third party validations of the business models and, and, the, and the opportunities and create step ups in value in those, those organizations as well. Uh, and I think this is from a shareholder point of view important because with this third party validation, we have been able to increase our net asset value uh, by 35% year over year from uh, 2020 uh, to 2021. Of to uh, to about 32, a little over 32 million pounds. We believe that you know because of these fundings and and because of the, this net asset value increase, uh, we are and our companies are well positioned for the future. In particular, we're pleased to to also have as part of the, the step up in values this year the addition of Benefi as a strategic investor in Device Authority. These actions that that we we have had in, in additional uplifts in value enable us to gain, gain through our companies significant commercial traction and grow their monthly recurring revenues. And as you know, we've been emphasizing monthly recurring revenues as a key metric uh, for how companies are valued in, 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 the, in the marketplace. And, and our companies have had significant impact uh, on their monthly revenues or their annual recurring revenues through 2021 and now into through, through, 
through to 2022. And I believe it's important from, from your perspective and ours that we, we look at these, these, these monthly recurring revenues and the trends being created by our companies to, to evaluate the, the value of the business and understanding that value of the business, monitor it to make appropriate decisions to create value for you or shareholders through a trade sale or an IPO when the time is right or when the opportunity presents itself through an unsolicited offer. You know, our companies, we believe, are for sale every day, um, but we're not trying to sell them. Uh, and, and, and we're waiting, you know, for the appropriate moment to get the maximum amount of value for you, our shareholders. And I think we now have reached a position uh, in, in, our, in our businesses where this recurring revenue is really having a serious impact of value creation that we believe will return, return handsome rewards for, for our shareholders and for turn in general. Lastly, in March, we agreed to participate in a new venture capital fund, the Shore Valley Ventures, uh, a UK software company with <clears throat> UK software technology venture firm uh, that has as its major partner, the British Business Bank uh, and, and a, a series of other investors besides Turn. We believe our participation in this new Silicon Shore Valley Venture Fund is an excellent way for us to broaden our exposure to the marketplace that we share in our, in our vision between Turn and Shore Valley Ventures and a way to, in effect, curate opportunities for us to co-invest co with them either at, at the inception of an investment or later on as a follow-on uh, to a Series A. We believe that with, with our modest capital in, in, involvement within Shore Valley Ventures, we have created a potentially significant opportunity to create benefits for our shareholders. But rather than have me go on about Shore Valley Ventures, we have today Barry Downs, managing partner of Shore Valley Ventures, and we'll let him tell you himself uh, about Shore Valley Ventures, his vision, the, the synergies between our our businesses and, and, and what he sees as the future for his fund and our, and our working together. Following Barry, you will hear from Device Authority's CEO, Darren, uh, who have, who's recorded a presentation for you about, about, about the business and, and the current state of affairs. And then we'll close with Alistair uh, giving you a, an update uh, on, on Wild, his experience being a public CEO on the NASDAQ North and, and what he sees as the future for that business. So without further ado, I'll turn the, the, the screen over to Barry and Barry, uh, please let, let them know about your exciting venture firm. Thank you, Al, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, just pop up a quick presentation here and I got that up. Can, can everybody see that? Great. Well, it's great to be here um, uh, with Al and the team at TURN uh, to tell you a bit about um, Shore Valley Ventures. Um, so uh, as Al mentioned, Shore Valley Ventures is a UK venture capital firm. And uh, the fund that Al is talking about is a new 85 million pound venture capital fund investing across the UK um, that's anchored by the British Business Bank. Uh, we have a team in London and also in Cambridge, and we also have one in Manchester as well, and we're, we're shortly to uh, officially open the Manchester office, and that's for on the ground uh, origination of new uh, software technology companies. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we're anchored by the British Business Bank, um, they provided 50 million pounds of the 85, and it's on a, a capital drawdown model. Uh, and this is effectively what this means is that the funds are only called as we're doing investments into new companies, uh, and then cash is returned immediately on to our, to our LPs on the exit of those businesses. Now, we're targeting key disruptive technology areas that have enormous potential over the next number of years. And those areas are very aligned with the turn investment areas as well. So things like metaverse and immersive tech, AI and IoT, and also security as well. Uh, and we have a particular focus on software. And then um, the, what I think what's particularly interesting for LPs is that the British Business Bank model offers an exceptional profit share model 
to uh, LPs such as Term. And it's, it's a model that's not generally available in the marketplace. So um, in summary, the BBB are, are, are putting in 50 million of the 85 and taking 20% of the profits, whereby uh, LPs such as Turn are putting in 35 million of the funds, but taking 60% of the profits. So there's a kind of a leveraged return, profit share return for, uh, for LPs such as Turn. And Turn themselves have made, as Al made, have made a capital commitment uh, of five million pounds out of the 85, and that, that's approximately 5.88% of the fund. And I guess the, the key reason for doing that is there's really fantastic synergies between Turn and Shore Valley. And I'll talk about those synergies as we, as we go through the presentation. So first of all, just a, just a little bit of background on me and the team. Um, so um, I'm, I'm a technologist. I, I go back uh, over 25 years in the technology business strong focus on software. Uh, my initial work experience was in the Boston area, uh, which is one of the top tech hubs in the, in the US, then Silicon Valley. And then when I came back to Europe, um, there's a couple of notable things I draw your attention to. I ran a, a research group called the Walton Institute, which was a leading European R&D center looking in, into the future where technologies are being developed and, and where, how they'll evolve over uh, medium term and long term. And then coming back to today and building out those technologies with some of the largest companies in the world across Europe, US and also Asia as well. Uh, and then one of the other things that I've done is I founded a software company. So I've had the full founder journey from founding a software company building that company and ultimately selling the company to a uh, Silicon Valley uh, giant. And in this case, it's Red Hat, who are a global leader in open source. And Red Hat were recently sold themselves to uh, IBM. Uh, and so my background is, is kind of tech, looking into the future, looking at where technology is going. And then, of course, uh, we established Shore Valley in 2017 and um, you, doing investment management and selecting companies and, and investing in those companies. Um, Brian, who's a co-founder in the fund, has a 12-year investment management track record that covers venture debt, venture capital, special situations, has a lot of experience in the public markets in, in the UK as well, uh, but also has a founder background and also, uh, in fact, helped me with Feed Henry, uh, and also goes back and has a long technology background uh, specializing in artificial intelligence. Um, Keen, who's our head of platform, and platforms are value add for companies. Uh, Keen has a contact list uh, that's a who's who in Silicon Valley because he spent most of his career in Silicon Valley before moving back to Cambridge. And um, uh, Kean uh, worked with a, with a fantastic fund in Silicon Valley called SVG Global, uh, and that was a fund, an accelerator, and also a consulting firm, and ran a network of the top executives in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, that's very additive to and supportive of, of Al's experience in Silicon Valley as well. And then Isabel uh, runs our origination. Originally, she's come up in the venture capital industry originally Telefonica in London and Madrid, uh, then with Shipstead in London, which is a, a, a corporate VC. And then she was with the um, Barclays FinTech Accelerator before coming to Shore Valley. And she won the Specialist Investor of the Year Award in the uh, 2019 Women in Finance Awards. Uh, and this team has worked together for a long period of time. I, I, in particular, I've worked with, with Brian and Keane for over 12 years in one venture or another. Now we've expanded the team. Uh, we've, we've had Mel, we brought Mel on as well. And Mel has a significant entrepreneurial experience as well, but has an amazing network in the um, north of England. Uh, she's based in Leeds and doing origination for us in the north in particular. And then George uh, is based in Manchester along with Kieran. And um, George has again come up in the venture capital industry started as an analyst in, in London with Shorecap and has worked through the industry 
um, and uh, was recently with a fund in uh, Manchester that has an amazing track record of work working with angel investors as well. And Greg's a very experienced CFO of, um, of financial services organizations and, and, uh, and fund management and comes to us from uh, Sharp Capital in London, uh, was his previous uh, employer. And that, that, that team, I think, um, is going to support and augment the, um, the, the uh, turn team. And actually, um, there's great synergies here because Sure Valley is focused in London, Cambridge, in the north of England. Uh, obviously, we know Turn has is based in London, but also has very strong uh, connections in Scotland as well. And team members such as myself and Kean also have great exposure to Northern Ireland as well. And actually, the first investment of this fund um, is a Belfast-based company called Retinize, which is a glo which is going to become a global leader in the advertising uh, space and uh, and also uh, animation in that area. So just a quick um, just a, just a quick overview of our strategy here. And again, this is incredibly aligned with what uh, Alan and the team are doing in turn. Uh, going to the top left hand corner, we're really focused on a number of key areas, which which are almost identical to the areas that Turn is focused in. Really super high growth software areas, metaverse, immersive tech. Um, so for example, Turn has invested in VR. Um, we're investing in VR and AR and metaverse areas as well. AI, security, and also IoT as well. Um, uh, Al mentioned earlier on, uh, going to the top right-hand corner here, Al mentioned that one of the synergies here is on co-invest but also follow on as well, because we invest at the seed stage. So one way to think about us is we're scouring the country, we're looking for the top emerging uh, tech companies, and we get in at an early stage and lead those deals. And uh, Turn can come into any of those deals at that stage, or it can kind of hold back and come in at the next stage, which is the Series A stage. Uh, our, our focus is on, uh, leading at the seed, getting really, really attractive valuations, and then bringing in key partners such as Turn uh, as, as we go through the scaling rounds for the company. Um, as I mentioned, Geographies UK, uh, and there's, there's a couple of approaches to origination. Um, one of the approaches is traditional, kind of on the ground, working the regions, um, finding the best companies, but also we have a very strong proactive outbound outreach where we're using a data-driven strategy to find the best new emerging companies and getting out to them to talk to them about their capital and financing needs at an early stage before anybody else. So it's about building that relationship at, a, at an early stage with companies and then investing in them at the, at the right time. And then, um, I, th I think a very strong aspect of Sure Valley, which, which I think is again a great synergy with, with Turn, is we've got what we call a value add platform. And this is all about getting in uh, 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 from day one in the companies and helping them build the ARR that Al was talking about on, on the Turn uh, companies. Uh, and, and really over a 24 month period, getting the companies to uh, a million in annual recurring revenue or similar. Uh, and sometimes actually the companies will accelerate much faster than that as well. So it's, so it's all about getting in uh, and having a game plan for helping the companies create value in the first three months, the first six, the first 12, and then after that, raising the next round to scale the company up. And this is one of the benefits for Turn as well in that they can come in either at this early stage or at the scaling round or both. Um, I should say also, we're uh, the plan is to invest in 25 companies through this fund uh, over a five year period. So it's approximately five companies a year um, and getting in an early stage and then scaling these companies up. Now, in terms of the style of investment we do. So first of all, we're focused on this area of disruptive innovation. So disruptive innovation companies uh, typically have significant intellectual property in software, uh, but also it's not just about the tech, it's also about the creation of a new market. And 
uh, and these new markets ultimately uh, will grow and develop such that the company can become the dominant company in that market and become a billion dollar company. And the strategy here is capturing these potential billion dollar companies or unicorns at an early stage at low valuations, typically two to about eight million pounds, getting in there early, getting a good chunk of the, um, the equity in the company, and then helping them with partners such as Turn scale up and ultimately become those unicorns. And to help with that, as I mentioned, uh, we have this very strong value add platform that's really based upon our experience as entrepreneurs and founders, but also a network of uh, founders that we brought together to help the companies. So we have what we, what we call a platform advisory group, and that's over 50 people now across the globe who are experts in their areas and previous founders that can come in and help those companies grow and scale as well. So it's really about expanding the network. Very large number of those executives are based in Silicon Valley. And then we've also got um, uh, UK and Europe, and then also, also Asia as well. And this is great. So for example, once these startup companies uh, get going and want to internationalize and trade outside the uh, UK, uh, quite often the US is the first target. Of course, uh, Al, Al has, has and the team a phenomenal Silicon Valley experience. Uh, we're, we're bringing some extra experience to bear with key contacts in these regions to help that scaling. And similarly for Europe and also for Asia as well. So a so bit of background on the British Business Bank for anybody who's not familiar with it. So this is a, a, a government-owned bank whose aim is to help British business to start, start up scale and stay ahead. And BBB um, uh, post-Brexit uh, is fulfilling its original mandate, but, but also taking over from the European Investment Fund as well in the UK, and is rolling out a whole series of programs for, directly for business, but also they fund um, uh, and support venture capital funds as well. Typically runs out of two divisions, a division called the ECF, uh, division and then their patient capital division. So uh, we, uh, our allocation of 50 million from the BBB is through their ECF division. And ECF is, is kind of like the program uh, where the British Business Bank uh, supports um, uh, emerging managers in the UK. So these are the, the managers that they want to support uh, become the next, um, uh, the next Dawn Capitals, for example, or Notions or Episode Ones because they've all come through the BBB program. And I guess what's different about us is uh, our focus on very specific areas that are aligned with TURN and also our whole of the UK approach as well. Uh, one thing just to note on this also is, um, this is kind of a great stamp for, for LPs in that the British Business Bank did a two year due diligence on the team and the fund and the plans and uh, probably the most comprehensive due, due diligence in the industry. So, so it's great. I think that's great reassurance to investors as well. So just a little bit on the deal um, that that turn uh, bought into. Uh, so BBB are committing 50 million and will receive a 20% 20, 20 profit share and a 3% prioritized return. And then LPs receive a 60% profit share. So this is this kind of leveraged return uh, that all the investors are getting. So as the fund generates profits from selling companies, um, the LPs uh, get a, um, a disproportionate return. Um, the fund is new, so we, we closed the fund uh, at the end of February 2022 at 85 million. Uh, and we also did the first investment in Retinize at the same time. Uh, the fund is a hard cap of 95 million. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, the LP sign uh, what's called an LPA or an LP, uh, an LP agreement to invest on a drawdown basis. And this is an example of how capital is drawn down over time. And this matches the profile of investing in new companies uh, and then following on in those companies over time. And the great thing is it's very, very capital efficient because capital is only called when we're making investments and then it's returned immediately when we do an exit on a company as well. 
Uh, so super cap capital efficient for LPs. So just as a summary, I guess, and we can talk about synergies as we're going through this as well. So we, uh, uh, in terms of the team that's, uh, that's working on this project for TURN, uh, first of all, we have uh, proven a number of proven uh, founders in the team who've gone full life cycle. And that's very important for this stage of development for the companies we invest in. They like to deal with founders. They like to work with people who've been on the same journey as them. VC, as it gets to later stages like B and C, uh, is more traditional finance. But at the early stages, companies like, uh, typically they're technically led, companies like talking to people who are of technical backgrounds and founder backgrounds. And I think that adds a lot of value to the mix uh, for, our, for our investors and for the companies. We have deep, deep experience in the areas that we're investing in. And also, uh, and this is very complementary and synergistic with um, TURN as well. Uh, we, we have been investing in these areas since 2017. I have personally been working in some of these areas going back to 2010. We know all of the major companies. We know the acquirers of companies. We, we can help portfolio companies um, uh, with sales and with talent. Uh, so this experience in these areas, I think, is very uh, synergistic with, um, with, with, with Al and the team in turn. And also the team within it has, has uh, experience across the gamut from you know, pre-accelerators to accelerators to venture capital to venture debt and M&A as well. And we have demonstrated a, uh, a capacity to win really high quality deals and produce exits and, and a really strong track record. Um, VC for me is, is also a network business as well. So you know, uh, we have offices in London, Dublin, Cambridge, and Manchester for origination. Um, we uh, get out around the country. We, we, we meet investors, or sorry, we meet companies where they are based. Um, typically, uh, we, where we take up offices, we take them up in accelerators where the companies are based. Um, so really close connectivity to the entrepreneurial uh, community across the UK, but also these great connections across Europe and in particular to Silicon Valley, again, very synergistic with the term team. And I, so I think us working together, you know, will create great synergies and, and, and supercharge the results that we're both creating as a team. And then this platform that's all about delivering mentoring, networking, training to the companies we invest in. That's all about accelerating their development, but also reducing our risk as well. Um, and we have a tremendous track record of getting companies from those early stages to series A, series B, and also IPO and, and trade sale as well. Um, and then, um, you know, as I mentioned, a uh, strong track record of getting these companies to uh, across these, um, these key stages and a vision as to where these industries that we're investing are going, and you know we, we couldn't be we couldn't be happier uh, and tri more thrilled to be working with Al and the team in turn. And we really look forward to uh, the next twelve months and doing some great deals together and, and briefing you on those deals. Well, thank you very much, Barry, for uh, for that presentation. Um, as Barry says on his, his final slide, um, if you do have any further questions for him, please do use the, uh, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type them in and Barry will be available at the end of the presentation to, uh, to answer anything. Um, Barry, if you can, thank you, <laughs> stop sharing now. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, um, Darren Antill from uh, Device Authority is currently in meetings in the US, given the, uh, the time difference, so he's unable to join us at the moment, but he has provided a presentation which he's recorded for us, um, and I'm now going to, uh, to play that. It's about 15 minutes or so, um, and then we'll move on with the, the rest of the agenda. Hello everybody, this is Darren Antill from Device Authority. Apologies I can't be there in person, but I'm travelling on the east coast uh, uh, of the US this week. Uh, however, I've got a short update for you 
Uh, hopefully you find it useful and insightful. To kick off, what I wanted to do, just by way of an introduction to everybody, and especially for those who don't really know us, is to just show you a short video uh, that introduces device authority and effectively what we do. So we'll kick straight off now and I'll be back. The workforce is being transformed by three non-human entities, robotic process automation, physical robots, and IoT systems. They're used and exist all around us in business critical applications that are powering smart factories, connected cars, powerful telemetrics, connected medical devices and supply chain and logistics operations. When the digital identities and certificates, username and password credentials of these non-human entities rely on weak security measures, attackers can exploit this to steal sensitive data disrupt device operations and cause physical harm. And as adoption accelerates, integration becomes more complex and machines have increased connection to sensitive data, security and identity lifecycle management needs to be improved. Keyscaler, our edge to enterprise IoT security platform, automates security management for the entire machine lifecycle, from production through to decommission and recommission. It enables total trust in your devices, ensures device to cloud data security, and unlocks the potential of secure IoT at scale. Okay, so hopefully um, some of you may well have seen that, but let me now jump into um, uh, the presentation by way of giving you a quick update. <coughs> okay. Right, so I guess if there, there's a few takeaways today, um, and one of them I think is just to consider um, one, the progress we've made off a fantastic quarter that we've just had, uh, new logos in some new industries, uh, and some significant, uh, I guess, phase rollouts as people are now moving from uh, pilots through to production. So we've had a good quarter, we've got some good recognition, uh, and I wanted to you know, give you a bit of an insight into that. The thing to bear in mind, because often people consider what we do in terms of the market, I just wanted to point out the whole, the real challenge that we're dealing with here is how are we managing trust, that's device trust and data trust at scale for IoT devices that are typically not managed by humans and will be of a volume and a magnitude that is just exponentially more than what has been dealt with in the last 25 years or so when people refer to identity and access management of the enterprise, i.e. people. So we're all focusing on things. The market is huge. You know, recent data suggests it's well over 400 billion in terms of the amount of spend. And, you know, and, the, and COVID is really accelerating digital transformation. You know, as CEO, I've seen COVID drive a number of new uh, business models and a number of new markets. Medical seems to have accelerated further as people look to bring on more devices, both existing in the field and new devices to market. But, but also we've seen, I guess, the 2.0 version of automotive, the sustainability, energy efficient, EV type initiatives as people are moving to new uh, power generated electric vehicles. So we've seen a number of new initiatives there and some new customers. So, you know, we see the market now continuing to accelerate specifically in some primary verticals. If you look at the market dynamics, I mean, growth is one thing, but there's also been significant consolidation. Um, you know, we've seen some of the partnerships that we've, we, we effectively work with have been acquired by others, including Meccano, Digicert, uh, Clarity, uh, Clarity and Medigate. You've also seen a significant number of increases. You know, if it's not hacking colonial pipelines that had a significant, that led to a significant shortage of oil last year in North America. Uh, but, you know, there are more and more um, threat vectors to consider. There are more and more attacks. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that a, a bit later. And there's a significant uptake in the amount of legislation. It's not just about best practices that we saw really take the, I guess, the early stage. And you've got um, specifications being driven by NIST and IOTSF and others. But now you've got things like the Biden executive order and specifically uh, compliance and, and regulatory requirements coming down, often being driven by North American um, um, regulatory requirements, which I think, again, 
are tapping in or are extending effectively now into global requirements. And we've seen evidence of that, and I'll touch on that. But what's really good, I guess, from our perspective, if you look at PKI in the enterprise, is a well-established um, security approach that's been used by many professionals for 25 years or so. Um, but now that nearly half the drivers or the reasons for deploying PKI is for IoT solutions, and that's right in our wheelhouse, and we effectively enable people to automate that and manage that through the life cycle. So people are seriously considering PKI for IoT deployments. And the challenges for securing IT are many. There is no one silver bullet here. There's no proven identity model. People often care and want to make sure they secure data end to end, in transit and at rest. Um, identity uh, of things is becoming the new perimeter. The firewall days are long gone when you're considering devices connected to the internet in very remote devices, on oil rigs, on cars, on trains, you know, in the wild. And both applications have to interact and work with their devices. So you need to be able to trust the device. If you can't trust the device, you can't trust the data. And then it's not just onboarding that device once, it's then managing that through the life cycle. And many of these business models or devices, you just take automotive um, examples we have, you know, the lifespan of these is like 15 to 30 years. So there's a, a significant number of challenges. And then, of course, you've got more and more compliance and regulatory requirements, which, by the way, I think is an absolutely a good thing. And it is well overdue that people are starting to take this more seriously. The good news in the last, uh, I guess, couple of months, I mean, analysts is always an, uh, an important piece of our market. You know, it's still a new market, large companies, customers get educated by what analysts uh, effectively guide and advise. Uh, and ABI research did a you know, significant amount of research and absolutely recognized device authority as the leader in identity device cycle, cycle management. And it's great to see that some of these cybersecurity or enterprise security companies uh, were considered in that mix as they looked to pivot and add IoT capability into their offering. But you know, but IoT and securing those things is what we do, and we came out top right. Uh, and you've seen other examples of that um, uh, from people like the uh, Quadrant Smart Matrix previously. But this is good for us. So just touching on some of the um, uh, compliance. So people talk about the executive order. Originally came out through the Trump administration, now driven by the Biden uh, executive order. And I think, you know, this is, this is just really the start. And SBOM, or Software Bill of Materials, is one of those things that's talking to people really to sort out, they have visibility of their supply chain, being able to trust the components, the devices, the solutions they consume. And, and specifically, if this isn't addressed in North America, it will become law, you would not be able to provide solutions to the military, defense, or other um, you know, government-based organizations. And commercial organizations will start to look at this. And we've seen people now starting to bring this up and talk to us about it. So the S-bomb is an important thing, good example of, being, of it being driven down through IT, IoT, and industrial IoT. Specifically, as critical infrastructure becomes under threat, uh, and, you know, with wars and other challenges we have now in the world, even more so. And in recent weeks, the Biden executive, again, has positively reinforced this, especially those commercial organizations that have critical infrastructure that is key to North America. And, and in uh, recent weeks, we are aware as well, you know, this, this whilst North America leads in many ways, the National Cybersecurity Center, uh, part of GCHQ is also considering uh, similar things, and we are now involved in a dialogue with them and other key partners. Something else I just wanted to touch on, because we often talk about the challenges in IoT, but I think it's also important to understand the life cycle and where many of the other organisations, or some of the competitors, some of the partners, sit. Because it's understanding this is to, to see the root of how you fundamentally solve the problem for enterprise customers. So we deal with many people on that top left, and you've seen um, that we've announced a partnership, and Avnet will bring out its new solution, including Keyscaler, uh, as its security operations credential management offering um, uh, in the coming weeks. So step one and two is important, really, as people look to, to put secure by design or secure manufacturing capability into uh, the products as they go into the uh, supply chain. And, and there we work with people where they either OEM our technology or we work with them so they become key scaler ready. So they're ready for customers who look to deploy such devices with those technologies in so they can manage them through the life cycle. Um, 
of those specific projects or, or products. Onboarding is important. Once you've got it onboarded, again, it's not just doing it one time only, but it's doing it again over and over again uh, with new devices. Again, through the because people typically roll out devices, it could be 300, 5,000, 10,000 over you know, a two or three year period. So that's really important. So adopting standards is becoming more important. But the key is really how you get those devices to interact with an application. How do you consume the data, assess the data, uh, or use the data? How do you allow people sometimes to interact into that data securely? And that's really important because many organizations have already spent significant investment in their cybersecurity or their security operations for enterprise. So being able to manage the IoT use cases in the enterprise is important. So integration is important. Being able to leverage existing investments is important. And Keyscaler effectively pulls all that to get together. And as some partners like Microsoft has referred to, is the glue. So that's where we fit and that's where other people fit. And you've seen our solution before, and this is just a very simplistic model. You know, we very are very much closely coupled to the application, onboarding and protecting um, that application, and, and onboarding and managing the credentials of those devices, and then the data end to end. And then the reason I wanted to blow them this picture out, just to give you, this is a more realistic architecture view about how people think about it. I've already talked about on the right, how people integrate into their enterprises. How do they leverage investments they've already made? How do they make doctors and nurses, for example, engage with some of the data that comes from those devices? How do they engage with their cloud platforms? which one would be key scaler, you know, in the middle section in the data center. But more importantly, really on the left, how do you ensure these different industry types, these different device groups, that you're able to onboard, manage their credentials, manage the secure data through the life cycle, ongoingly for many years without human interaction. And, and where we operate really on the left hand side is we clearly are on a device or we engage with material on a device or we work with those key scale ready partners so that's just another more detailed view of how it fits now i touched on some of the use cases and in industries you know again off the back of a great quarter we see some exciting things going on in the automotive space we've got um, some new customers who have come on board specifically deploying powertrain solutions uh, replacing old diesel truck tech engines we've got uh, new connected cars now going through to production um, and one of them shared a champagne moment where they're able to automatically onboard and deploy secret keys in the cars in a matter of seconds because of key scaler at volume to several hundred cars at once, which has saved them one a lot of money, but two enable them to have a secure solution. Other examples are in the medical space. We've talked about medical robots before. We now have a second organization talking about robots that they want to make sure they can onboard and secure using key scaler, but, but that effectively is the tip of the iceberg as they look to then consider how they roll that solution out for other device type groups. So we're going through a pilot with another organization in that space. And we're working with a sterilization equipment company now who's looking to roll out from its original pilot, one device groups to uh, two and, th and then three different device groups as they roll out through um, medical hospitals in North America and around the world. So good, exciting news cases. Of, and again, just building on that, I touched on automotive, industrial um, automotive or industrial engines is very important. Um, we've had, again, new inquiries about how people secure specific gateways and data that comes from engines. PKI management on devices is very important. And these are very big, sophisticated, expensive engines. Uh, and one pilot that was successfully uh, completed at the back end of last year is now looking to deploy up to 10 to 20,000 new devices uh, this year. So we're starting to see people post COVID now to accelerate um, their rollouts. So in terms of partnerships, you know, more and more customers have, have been picking device authority. And I just wanted to let you know, give you, you know, an insight into some of those. Microsoft, we continue to work with. We're working very close to them in a number of sectors, and we are driving towards what's called our IP co-sell readiness, where customers will be able to get credit for consuming key scaler through the marketplace at Microsoft, but also Microsoft sales reps will be able to get credit for when device authority key scaler is also consumed by their customers. Avnet uh, will be launching their brand new IoT Connect pro, uh, platform uh, in the next quarter. There is a big event. This effectively aggregates the service for all of the chip vendors. And there's a big event which we're participating in May uh, when they launch their product, where the chip vendors will be present. And this really gives a great solution to chip vendors and device manufacturers. 
Um, I'm over, as I said, in the uh, well, Boston and now Virginia area because I'm meeting uh, Virginia Innovation Partnership Corporation. Um, only recently we were invited to help present as part of the um, um, build that they're looking at in terms of the blueprint that they're looking to roll out. Uh, the UK science minister and the UK government were over uh, for a briefing and we were actively participate in that and you know it's interesting because since then the National uh, uh, Centre for Cybersecurity has also engaged with us which I think you know is interesting as people looking to adopt some of the standards and practices again being driven by North America and what we really like about the Virginia state is this creating a blueprint for government and other um, critical infrastructure projects and again we have insight into some new uh, opportunities already from that. And then Venify, clearly recognised as a brand leader. I'll touch on that in a minute. They invested in the company last year. They see a number of IoT use cases. Uh, and we will be going to the RSA event, the big global cybersecurity event in San Francisco week one with Venify. And we're um, engaging now on an um, enablement plan for their sales force looking for new opportunities. But just to touch on Venify, Venify effectively has been creating and has been identified as a leader of a new category called machine identity management which really differentiates the human and non-human identities. This has been a hype cycle, now a new category uh, defined by Gartner. There's a copy or a link to a report if you're interested in that. But the main component is people have been really securing identities around servers, apps and laptops for you know, 20 plus years or so. And then there was mobiles and there's MDM uh, and MAM type solutions. And now there's IoT devices. So three really core components that get wrapped up under that. We're the experts and the leaders in IoT device management or lifecycle management. And you can see organizations like Key Factor, Entrust, and AppView all vying for a place in this segment. So I just wanted to give you a perspective on that because I do get some inbound questions um, about that, uh, that space and where we fit in it. And then I guess, finally, just um, before we wrap up, just to give you a flavor in terms of where we're moving the product, um, we continue to adopt you know, a PLG product-led growth strategy where customers are asking us to advance and add more features as we become stickier and as we look to roll out and solve more problems for our existing customers. And that's really important to us. But one big thing that we're looking at is how do we if effectively adapt our solution and bring on board a new engine that has AI and ML capability that will be added later this year to give people proactive insights so they can detect when devices are compromised. Imagine a scenario when behavior was changing on a device and you were able to learn from that and effectively then block or turn that device off until something was done about it. So that type of capability we'll be looking to add to our platform. And then finally, as I wrap up, there's a number of new assets. One, I've already showed you the video. Here's some new information that's available. I know some people like to download it and read it. These are the latest new things. So I just thought I would give you a quick summary so you can click on any links and go and investigate for your own benefit. Thank you very much for your time and uh, have a good event. Thank you. Well, I hope you uh, you found that uh, presentation from, uh, from Darren uh, interesting. Um, We'll now move on to uh, Alistair, who's going to give you an update on Wild. So, Alistair, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me just get my slides up. Well, there you go. So, my, my name's Alistair Williamson, and uh, I'm the, the CEO of Wild Networks. And I just wanted to spend 15 minutes just taking you through who we are, what we do, and how we make money and where we are today. So if I was to sort of look at, you know, terming wild networks, what are we? Well, we're a virtual satellite network operator, and we, we, we look at sort of three key things. And, and, and one is contactless solutions, frictionless solutions, and sustain more solutions. And I'll take you through how we sort of fit into all of those use cases. So. What do we do? I, I talked about being a virtual satellite network operator, but what we do is we offer affordable satellite connectivity for the IoT anywhere in the world. And as, as you all know, or you've probably heard me say this before, only 15% of the world um, has wireless coverage. The, 80, the other 85% has no access to the internet. And it, it's this lack of global connectivity that's actually holding back the growth of the internet of thing from adding about two to three trillion dollars to global gdp in the next 10 years so 
what, what we did at Wild is we, we developed a solution called Wild Connect. And, and what it simply is, it's an affordable wireless solution to allow you to connect IoT and devices and sensors anywhere in the world directly to low Earth orbiting satellites to provide 100% global coverage. So we're going out to our customers with a solution that basically takes them from their 50%, their 15% uh, access to the internet to 100% global connectivity for their sensors and devices. So if I look at the three sort of key things when, when we're talking to customers and, and to shareholders, and you know, the first is what, what is our value to our customers? And it really is very, very simple. We offer our customers 100% global coverage for their IoT devices and sensors. And then I'm always asked about, so, so what's, what differentiates you um, to, to other satellite IoT solutions? Well, we, we went down a path of trying to address affordability for our customers. So we offer our customers low cost terminals and we also operate in free to use spectrum. When I say we operate in free to use spectrum, we use LoRaWAN as the technology to deliver data from our Wild Connect module embedded into a sensor directly to the satellite. Now, traditional sort of satellite IoT solutions use um, regulated and paid for spectrum. So they have to pay governments in every country they want to deliver that data to a certain chunk of money every year. And that's been very prohibitive in trying to get an affordable solution. So we've taken that prohibitive cost out of the whole concept of satellite IoT by actually using LoRaWAN as a technology to connect IoT devices directly to low Earth orbiting satellites. And respect to the business model, the business model is also very, very simple. And I think you've heard the word reoccurring revenue throughout this presentation, but the way our model works, very simple. We're selling our customer a terminal or an IoT module, which is a piece of hardware and a piece of firmware that they can embed into their sensors. And that product called Wild Connect allows data to be transferred or delivered to satellites and then we charge our customers a monthly fee for operating that service. So that's where the reoccurring um, revenue comes in in our business model. Obviously, as we're focusing um, primarily on that 85% of the world's surface where there's no access to the internet, you know, our, our markets are transportation, agriculture, environment, and maritime. And sort of just to let you know where we are at the moment, um, we launched Wild Connect in Q1, which is our IoT module and terminal. And we're launching the service in the second half of 2022, but already the hardware piece has been launched to the market. And we're actually in sort of commercial test phase with, um, for I believe there's about 20 to 22 customers we're going through commercial test phase with. There are launch customers and they're customers such as Bayer, Fujitsu and Chevron. As I said, the service, this actual service is gonna be launched uh, in the second half of 2022 when we start to charge that reoccurring fee for actually using the service. And at the moment, we're basically building um, a pipeline and a pretty robust pipeline of purchase orders. And to date in Q1, we launched Wild Connect. And to date, we've, we've gathered purchase orders of about 28 million krona. So what does it look like? And I, I talk about satellite IoT. Um, and, but, but our solution is more than just satellite IoT. You know, we're providing a hybrid terrestrial LoRa satellite IoT solution. So you see a picture of Wild Connect. It looks like a terminal. In actual fact, that's a third part. That's a, a wild terminal. But in reality, it's the electronics inside it that we're integrating into sensors. Now, that device, Wild Connect, will not only just connect you to a terrestrial LoRa network, but as I say, once you move out of coverage of that 15% of the world's surface, it will then look for a satellite and deliver that data to satellites. 
that satellite will then basically deliver the data back down to a ground station and into a product that we have called Wild Fusion. And Wild Fusion is our provisioning platform and the payment platform. So that's the platform that our customers, customers will log into to get their data, to visualize their data. And that's the platform that provisions Wild Connect and also is the payment platform for our reoccurring revenue. So, you know, where's Wild going with satellite IoT? And I, I've just outlined um, a few verticals and quite a number of different applications, but there are multiple applications in agriculture, the environment, energy, maritime, transportation, logistics, and sort of market reports point to a market that's started in 2021 grown to about 5.9 billion in 2025 and that's focusing primarily on satellite iot we're basically looking at a, a number if you take that 5.9 billion we, we have done our own work and looking at what does that mean for wild well you know for, for wild itself we're, we're looking at about a market uh, by 2025 of revenues of about 650 million US dollars. And as I said, we're actually in the test phase with our launch partners and looking to launch the full end-to-end -end satellite service in the second half of 2022. And I just want to go through three different use cases. I showed a lot of use cases on the previous slide, but one of the use cases and, and where we've already collected orders for so far in Q1 is, is in agriculture, in integrating our IoT module into soil moisture sensors. And this is really about sustainability, about how to increase yield, reduce and optimize inputs and improve sustainability. And as you all know, the world's population is set to grow by about another 2 billion people by 2020, uh, 2050. You know, that's going from 7 billion to 9 billion people. And today we can't even feed ourselves. The other data point is agriculture is responsible for about 30% of the waste in water globally. So there's a big problem that needs to be addressed, how we can feed this population and how we can do it sustainably. So we're working with customers and we receive purchase orders to integrate our connectivity solution, our satellite IoT solution into their soil moisture sensors. And already they've actually proven that by actually collecting data from soil moisture sensors and actually optimizing the irrigation um, in, in, in farming can actually increase the yield of crops by up to about 37% and also reduce the consumption of water by about 30%. So there's huge gains to be made out of taking this technology and deploying it into agriculture. So that's sort of a sustainability uh, use case. I want to move to a sort of contactless use case. And this is one that we're doing with um, a large oil and gas or energy provider in the US. And just to give you an indication of some of the costs that some energy providers are actually paying through spillage of oil. You know, BP paid up to $60 billion in 2010 through quite a substantial oil spillage, and that didn't actually include the cost and the massive impact on the environment. So what we're doing with these energy providers is basically looking at how we can use our technology to monitor corrosion within oil pipes so that we can do preventative maintenance. So we get, our customers can understand when they need to go out and look at replacing parts of pipes ensuring that they can actually reduce the downtime and ensuring they can actually reduce the amount of spillage. So that's sort of one type of use case that we're sort of engaged in in the energy sector, which is really corrosion monitoring. As you can imagine, a substantial number of these assets and oil pipes and gas facilities are in location where there is no connectivity through traditional terrestrial coverage. And as you know, this, 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 this is a, a, a deal that uh, I want to just talk a bit about. And this is uh, a consortium that we put together in January this year. And this is all about frictionless use cases. This is about the supply chain. This is tracking assets in the supply chain. And just to give you some, some pretty you know, incredible numbers, um, 
$2.4 billion of cargo is lost or damaged each year just at sea. You know, that's a huge number. You know, $30 billion worth of cargo is stolen. And 81% of businesses experience, you know, one supply chain disruption each year. So we, we put together a consortium. It's called the MIMIC Consortium. And it includes UTELSAT, who I'm pretty sure you all know is our satellite partner. But it also included a company called Senet uh, in the US. And Senet is one of the largest, well, is the largest LoRa terrestrial provider in the United States. And they also operate in another 72 countries around the world. And so we put this consortium together where UTELSAT has the, 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 the low earth orbiting satellite um, solution. Senet has the terrestrial LoRa capability and WILD provides the communication. So we're providing all the communication from all of the sensors to satellites and basically going to our customers with a complete 100% global solution with a hybrid terrestrial and satellite IoT solution. So I talked a bit earlier about who our launch partners are and um, we've got a substantial number of launch partners. and. and you know, launch partners are customers that are testing our solution at the moment. And we're also engaged with these launch partners to actually convert them from, you know, testing our solution to actually getting purchase orders ahead of the launch of the commercial service. So we're working with some pretty large um, companies from Chevron, Bayer, Fujitsu, Senate, as I talked about earlier on. And these are customers that have signed contracts with Wild to test our solution or pilot our solution and engage with us commercially so that when we launch the service in the second half of 2022, we're actually got paying customers on the network. And so customers so far, I talked a bit earlier about the fact that we launched Wild Connect, that's our satellite IoT module, that's the hardware and, and the firmware piece that gets embedded into sensors. So we launched that in uh, Q1 this year. Um, we've got orders, uh, there's a list of customers there, we've got orders so far on Q1 of about 28 million krona. And, you know, those orders don't include the, the, the monthly service, you know, so that doesn't include the five month, uh, the $5 a month uh, service fee. So that's simply for the Wild Connect IoT module. And when we launch the service, then obviously these companies will be paying us um, a monthly service fee for actually using the network. So at the moment, we're going through all of this testing. We're converting these customers or are testing our solutions into purchase orders. And we're going to continue to generate further purchase orders through Q2, Q3, uh, and to when we actually launch the end-to-end -end service. So in summary, um, just like to sort of say a few things. One is we are solving a real world problem. You know, we're providing connectivity for access to the internet anywhere in the world. We're launching the commercial service in the second half of 2022. And that's the commercial service of not just providing the Wild Connect connectivity piece, but providing the global coverage through the satellites. So there's actually a complete service that we're offering our customer. We have, as I said earlier, um, a business model that has a one-off fee for the hardware IoT module, which we're basically selling at the moment. And then there's the reoccurring revenue model through the service or the monthly service fee that our customers will pay when we actually launch the service. We're signing agreements, um, we're securing purchase orders, patent is filed. I talked about us working in a large market and that's a market that's forecast to grow to about 5.9 billion US dollars in 2025. And we believe with the work that we're doing at the moment that that sort of puts us in about a 670 million US dollar in 2025 market that we're going to try to go after. So hopefully you've got a better idea of what Wild Networks is doing uh, and an update on where we are with the market. And I'll hand back to Tim and questions and answers. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alistair. Um, fascinating presentation as, as always. Um, we've had a fair few uh, questions uh, through, but there is a little bit of time for, for a few more. 
Um, we've got sort of 10, 15 minutes for, for the Q&A session. So if you have got anything for any of the, uh, the panellists, please do type them into the box and uh, I'll answer them. Um, as you've just finished, Alistair, we might as well start with a couple of questions for you, if that's OK. Um, first question uh, asks about some um, data security. Um, you mentioned that Wild Connect uses a free spectrum. How do you ensure that the data for users is actually secure? So we, we, we use, that's a good question. So we use uh, LoRa as a technology or LoRaWAN as a technology, and it has its own encryption um, built in as a standard. But we, we've actually done more than that. Um, you know, we really want to go to our customers with uh, secure connectivity. So Wild Fusion itself um, is a platform that I showed on a previous slide actually generates keys and those keys are rotated amongst all the devices, the Wild Connect devices on the ground. So we provide some pretty secure security across the whole end-to-end -end solution. Okay, thank you. Um, and the questioner here asks about um, the cost competitiveness of what you're offering. Um, obviously, massive benefits can save people an awful lot of money. Um, but do you think it's going to remain cost competitive for, for the benefits that it can provide as technology moves on in the coming years? Uh, yeah, the cost, cost with, with all technology, there is cost pressure. You know, let, let's be clear about this. But our, our, our goal at the moment is to offer a significant um, return on investment for our customers. And that's already been proven. People are placing substantial pur purchase orders on wild. And, you know, as I said earlier, we, we have basically taken out of the um, cost equation, the whole cost of paying for regulated spectrum. So, as I said, our competitors that are offering a solution using regulated spectrum are having to pay each country all over the world a big chunk of money every year to actually use that spectrum. We've taken that cost out of our offer. So, you know, we are way ahead when it comes to offering a competitive satellite IoT solution to our competitors. But I say, you know, that, that pressure will continue. But, you know, our ambition is to have billions of these devices out there. So at, at the moment, you know, we, we, we're offering our customers um, a price of $5 a month to actually use the service. But yes, we will see pressure on that. But that pressure is good because we're looking to deploy, as I said, millions of devices out there. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. Um, you talked about the, the launch of the, the service. Um, can you just give us a little bit more detail of what's actually in place at the moment in terms of everything from satellites to uh, to sensors and what you've been doing with, with your particular customers? Yeah, so at this moment, we launched Wild Connect. Wild Connect is our IoT module. So, you know, that module is a satellite terminal and it gets embedded into sensors. So we're already selling that um, product uh, to sensor manufacturers, and that's where the, the orders we got in Q1 came from. So Wild Connect is already in the market. We've got customers buying it, and those customers are integrating that product into their sensor. That device sends data from the sensors to the satellites. So that's already commercial. That's being sold. Customers are buying it. And obviously what we want to do is to get as many of those deployed into sensors as soon as possible before we actually launch the service. So at the moment, there's satellite availability, and um, there's about four satellites at the moment that are um, providing connectivity. And obviously, we're looking to launch the service, deploying more satellites, um, launch the service second half of this year, and continue to launch more satellites. Our sort of concept um, on, on where we're going is, is, is to have about 24 satellites deployed. And that would basically give us connectivity anywhere in the world every one hour. So you understand where we're, we're, we're focusing on. We're focusing on those use cases where data is very important, but it's data that has a relevancy of about one to two to three hours every day. So when you talk about global coverage, you mean global coverage. So even remote areas, polar regions, you've got, we'll have polar orbiting satellites. We're, we're talking about the whole world here, potentially, to be uh, 
covered. Well, absolutely. These are low Earth orbiting satellites. Each one of them you know, goes around the world in a different plane every hour. So each satellite will cover the whole globe, um, you know, 100 percent in, in, in 24 hours. So if you get 24 satellites up there, then you're basically providing connectivity anywhere in the world every one hour. Thank you. It's often a question I get that when you say the whole world, do you mean the whole world? And obviously yeah, you do. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, Barry, I've had a couple of questions for, for you. Um, you talked about the synergies with, with TURN and, uh, and the partners working together. Could you just give us a little bit more colour on those and, and where you see the, the benefits of the relationship? Yes, of course, I'd be delighted to. And, and perhaps I might start, Alan, you, you might jump in as well. As, as we're talking about synergies. I mean, I think the, the starting point is um, we have very similar uh, investment strategies and very similar visions uh, covering the entirety of the uh, UK in these massively high growth sectors. Um, you know, we, and we've seen today IoT and security and, and also we're interested in AI and metaverse as well. And so, one of the ways in which I think we add value is we can be seen as, if you like, as a scout for Alan and the team uh, for, for co-invests, but also uh, sometimes catching companies at an earlier stage. And as they develop, uh, then Turn can come in and, um, and, and come in at the Series A round. Uh, but similarly, on a synergy point of view, you know, um, we've already met the team a number of times and we've talking about how we can share contacts, share leads, share opportunities. So it's a, a, a genuine kind of team coming together to go out there and find the best of the best of, of technology opportunities. Um, uh, in, in addition to that, in terms of sharing networks as well, we all have networks across the globe which can help uh, the companies that we're investing in and bringing together the best of Turns network and our network reaching from Silicon Valley to London uh, to uh, Asia as well. So we see that as very important also. And then actually, um, one of the things um, that we love to do is to encourage our, our portfolio companies to collaborate with each other. So there's a larger group there of companies working together as well, sharing knowledge, sharing uh, sharing opportunities as well um, and then of course we've got our advisors we've got a very large advisor group that can come in and help companies also so we'll be adding to terms and term will be adding to ours as well i don't know Al, if you want to add to that yeah i think i think what, what's important here is is what you just pointed out in that we have a belief in having a synergistic por portfolio portfolios of companies or the companies in the portfolio that can share technologies. And one quick for example is if, if you look at the recent in investment in Retinize by uh, Shore Valley Ventures, there are aspects of that technology that we believe can and will give uh, fundamental surgery, uh, potentially a, a huge competitive advantage uh, because understanding the movement of the eye and, and, and really creating this, uh, this, this capability that Retinize has uh, can accelerate the programs uh, that, uh, that that fundamental is putting into place. So we have a an overlapping network. Uh, we have technologies that are components of other businesses within our portfolio. And I think uh, as as we progress and, and learn more about each other's businesses, uh, this has tremendous value for our shareholders and for each of the uh, the investors uh, in in, uh, in Shore Valley Ventures. So it's a it's a I think something that uh, we'll have. Uh, impact uh, for years to come. Thank you. Um, and just another one for, for you, uh, Barry. Um, you mentioned the, the metaverse, um, something that we're reading lots about. It's uh, obviously, uh, you know, Facebook having changed their name, people are talking about it. Um, what do you see as a potential there and uh, what sort of companies might be of, uh, of interest to Shore Valley in that area? Well, uh, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the metaverse in many ways is a kind of a catch-all term these days as well. I mean, um, I don't know if, if, if um, anybody saw the, 
uh, the, the kind of Facebook um, event that Mark Zuckerberg ran where he presented one version of the metaverse, which was a very Facebook centric version. Um, but for example, it does include uh, VR. So Fundamental, for example, would be part of that. Uh, it includes AR as well. And it's also starting to bring in uh, decentralized technology or Web3 technology as well. So I saw a report recently that estimated that uh, over the next um, uh, five years, uh, that um, uh, metaverse could grow to be a, a, a trillion dollar business area. So there is really massive market potential there. But in terms of what I think I see near term, uh, it kind of breaks down into, we're seeing a dramatic acceleration of, of VR. And we see that you know, fundamental is a great example of that. Um, we're seeing a dramatic acceleration of AR. Um, so one, one of the previous companies we invested in is a groundbreaking AR uh, technology company based out of Cambridge. It's a spin out of Cambridge University. Uh, and, and so over the next couple of years, you, you're going to see, you know, phen phenomenal VR and AR devices. There's new headsets coming from, from uh, Meta and from Oculus. Everybody knows Apple's got an amazing product coming out later on this year. Uh, and that's going to drive, and, and that's a mixed reality product. So that's VR and AR. Um, so that, that's really going to uh, accelerate the market as well. But also you're seeing also a gaming merging with these technologies as well. So if you think about that vision that Zuckerberg showed, it has a lot of gaming technology built into it as well. And uh, gaming as an industry is bigger than music and movies put together. And it's not just video games, but the underpinning technologies are important as well. Um, so you're going to see opportunities in advertising, in animation, um, and in uh, enterprise uses of both metaverse, kind of Facebook style metaverses, and also enterprise AR as well. And then longer run, I think we are going to see more and more of these Web3 decentralized technologies integrated. And you're starting to see that on the fringes of gaming already with a name, an area of gaming called play to earn games. So right now, the biggest area of, of gaming worldwide is free to play, driven by mobile. That's where you can download a game for free and play it. Um, that's now turning in on the Web3 side into you play the game and you actually earn by playing that game. You, typically you're earning some sort of cryptocurrency. So uh, other areas we see growing are uh, end user tools as well uh, and AI in, in for animation and also in terms of uh, AI in industry around AR as well. So whilst it is a catch-all term, it does encompass a lot of what TURN already does and what we're interested in we tend to be interested in more uh, concrete uh, technologies that can be sold as a platform to generate ARR, but there, there's lots and lots of opportunities in that space. And I do think we're starting to see it become prime time and starting to see the acceleration of technologies to create a very, very large market opportunity. But lots of, you know, it's kind of the modern convergence space. When I, when I founded uh, Feed Henry, that was in the last wave of innovation, which was mobile innovation. Mm -hmm. And what came together to, to make the iPhone, that was an amazing convergence product that brought together chip technology and optical technology and wireless networks and software technology into something that grew exponentially. It's one of the fastest selling uh, products ever. We're now getting to the point where all these technologies are coming together for the metaverse. So I see uh, very shortly, we're going to see that exponential growth as well. Wonderful opportunity for all of the companies that, that Al and the team have invested in and all the ones we're going to invest in over, together over the next couple of years. Thank you, Barry. That's, uh, that's very helpful indeed. I've certainly learned something there. Um, Alistair, um, just going back to you, um, just got one question if you're, you're still there. Yes, excellent. Um, we've got a, a question here who says, um, obviously, heavy dependence on UTELSAT. Um, in the event that UTELSAT you know, was acquired by a competitor or there was a reason why 
um, you couldn't use their satellites. Is there any redundancy? Is there a, you know, other satellites that you could use should there be any issue with UTELSAT? We, 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 first of all, our technology works with all the UTELSAT satellites and will continue to do so. So it uses a, a standard uh, technology. Um, but yes, we are engaging with other satellite operators as well to broaden our reach into other use cases. Okay. Thank you. I think that's uh, that's addressed that one. Um, Al, I've had a, a few questions as we often do at these sorts of events on you know, more general turn points, a few of which were, were covered at the, the AGM, but I recognise that a large portion of the attendees here weren't able to make the AGM this morning. Um, the first one is is an often asked question about you know, why isn't more financial information provided on the uh, the turn companies? Could you just give us a little comment on that, perhaps in the same way as the comment was given earlier today at the AGM? Uh, I, I think you know, to, to to be crisp and and, and clear, uh, and and Barry can vouch for this as a as a fund manager of, of a venture fund. The the companies that we invest in are rapid growing companies uh, that are in very, very competitive markets. Uh, and as part of what we do uh, in, in making the investment in a company and getting the companies, and, and in some cases, the existing investors in the companies uh, to, uh, to allow us to be part of the business is to, in effect, guarantee that we won't release sensitive uh, financial information uh, about the company and the business. These non-disclosure uh, elements of the share purchase agreements are, are a critical component that uh, that young startups and their legal firms look for because it's very damaging to them if their competitor picks up on uh, some of the information. And as we said this morning, even at Companies House, the, the information that Company House requires here in the UK is de minimis in information that would reveal to a competitor significant in, in information and, and strategy about what's happening within the business. So uh, as we help develop these companies, we also you know, think it's important that we, we adhere to the, the, the policy and practice that is, is what is the, the way of investing in seed and A round uh, businesses as they become, uh, become bigger businesses uh, and uh, hopefully returns for our shareholders. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Al. Uh, and Barry, I presume you would agree with that. And you know, the information that uh, an investor in Shore Valley would get would be similar to an investor in turn. Yes. I mean, it's always, a, I would agree with Al, it's always a very fine balance. Um, the, uh, the, the companies generally don't like to put out a lot of information. They'll, they'll, uh, they're quite happy to talk about the products that they're developing and where those products are going. But generally, they don't like to give out um, customer information or financial information uh, whilst they're growth companies because, because of competitive reasons. I, I totally agree with that. So it can always be, and it's great, actually, the, 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 the info that Wild gave, for example, the device authority gave, because they gave a lot of customer information out. Um, it, it is something um, that we do work with the companies we invest in to try and encourage them. But... The companies are kind of private for for a reason that they, they want a period of time where they can they can build and experience rapid growth uh, without giving too much away to their competitors. And and software is a hyper competitive area, so the companies are always always paranoid about confidential information uh, for good reason. Sure, sure. No, thanks, Barry. That's that's very helpful. Um, and now moving back to you, um, we often get a lot of questions. I've got a few uh, typed in today about um, timelines. And you know, obviously, great progress being made by all of the companies. But how do you, as a board, balance that and the value tomorrow with value for for shareholders? Is that something that's you know obviously been regularly considered? But do you have any metrics that you're you're using to to balance those two things? Well, I think the, the key metric uh, that we look at is uh, MRR or AR, the the recurring revenue. And if you look at some of the recent reports from Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, uh, particularly in the SaaS software arena, uh, the multiples or the, the baseline multiple for valuing a software company uh, is in the range of 10 times uh, the, the annualized recurring revenues. So a turn, 
uh, as a board and, and, and as investment managers of, of the portfolio companies that we're in, uh, we are constantly on a monthly basis looking at both the recurring revenue, the trend in the recurring revenues, uh, the monthly recurring revenues, as well as the long-term value of the contracts that are also part of this recurring revenue model. So uh, as, as Darren, for example, talked about you know, a customer in the medical arena, you know, those contracts are generally five years in length. Uh, there's a, a scope of rollout within the, within the nature of that contract uh, that, that would generate revenues on a quarterly basis. We evaluate them uh, on, 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 on meeting their forecast uh, you know, on a quarterly basis, annualizing that, looking at the value of the business, uh, and, 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 and then trying to determine when that customers, that, that, that organization also beats another metric uh, that we use, the rule of 40. And, and the rule of 40 is uh, an area of, of, of where the revenue growth minus the, the, the EBITDA uh, is 40 or better. So as, as we go through that phase, we, we can fine tune where we believe a company is, is at a place where growth is now gonna require some bigger brother to get force multiplication. And, and that would be op the opportunistic time to bring that company to, to, to a sale or to, a, to an exit. Uh, but what also we do is our companies are for sale every day. Um, and one of the ways to exceed that 10 times multiple is to have an unsolicited offer come in for the business. Because every one of our customers, we work very hard to create partnership arrangements. Like if, again, we'll use device authority. There's arrangements within trust. There's arrangements now in a strategic investment from Benefi. There's an arrangements with Microsoft. When an unsolicited offer comes in, and this is why we do these partnerships and why we try to create these co-marketing arrangements and co-selling arrangements, uh, it creates a tension between, between the unsolicited offer and the other, other critical components of, 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 of the partnerships that we have, such that hopefully a bidding situation arises. And when a bidding situ a situation arises, we can exceed that 10 times sort of standard and get 15, 20 times multiples on the revenues. So, you know, we are focused every day, every month, every quarter on, on the trends within the, the recurring revenues. Uh, and, and the trend in the, in, the, in the rule of 40 to make sure that we're, we don't miss an opportunity, but we're also <clears throat> in our relationships and how we drive the board meetings. Because again, we don't run the companies, we're advisors you know, as board members to the companies we invest in, how we help motivate them to create a dependence and a, a, and a tension between their partnership arrangements, uh, such that at some point in the future, if someone should pull the trigger on an unsolicited offer, we're in a position to maximize the value we can generate from that, that potential sale or, or, or opportunity to, to our shareholders. And again, the other side of this, as we did with, within the, the case of, of Wild, uh, there's also a, a function here where the capital required uh, becomes, becomes so rich that an IPO becomes the real answer because an IPO uh, let's us stay as shareholders, and as in the case of Wild. But now Alistair has been able to go to the public markets uh, on NASDAQ North, raise additional capital without diluting uh, our, 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 our position. So uh, th there's a case where looking at the deployment of the satellite business and creating the virtual network operation that, that's going to be required to make this business go, Picking a place like NASDAQ North with a, with a rich history in telecommunications and, 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 and strategic investment, strategic institutional investors there to back it, you know, created a better opportunity for us to maximize, maximize our returns uh, by not having to sell our shares, but by bringing the public markets to, uh, to create value for our shareholders. So that exit, I think, will have many, many, many more returns uh, for our shareholders without us having to invest any additional dollars. So that's the, the, the trajectory and the balance we use in evaluating when and if to pull the trigger on a sale or when and if to pull the trigger on an IPO uh, to, to create value for our shareholders and not lose the opportunity to continue to have that value developed and delivered. Yeah, I hope that helps. I think so. I think so. Um, 
you know, I've always had a couple of questions just in, you know, if that value is created, how is it returned to shareholders? And I think, as you said, at the, the AGM, you know, it depends on specific circumstances, but dividends, share buybacks, and that's why we've got the authority today, or whatever's appropriate at the time, but never prejudging. We're, we're not as clever as the HMRC to try and take away returns. So, so we, will de- we will deal with it at the time. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious that we're now a minute past um, the, the, the close time. So I'd like to, uh, to thank Alistair very much for, for the wild presentation. But most of all, Barry, thank you very much for you joining us this evening. I think you know, found that extremely helpful. Al, thank you. Um, I'll pass on my thanks to, uh, to Darren for the, uh, the presentation that he's provided. But as always, um, there's obviously a few questions there that we can't answer for regulatory reasons. There are a few that we probably haven't answered in the depth that you would like. So if you have anything further, please do contact me at any time. Contact details on the bottom of any of Turn's announcements, turn at investor-focus.co.uk, and we will endeavour to uh, to come back. But most of all, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us this evening and wish you uh, an enjoyable rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.